My name is Tom Arnold. I'm CEO of Concern Worldwide. And I want to welcome everybody here to this important event today. We've almost 150 delegates from, if you like, global civil society here with us. We've got about 300 activists from Bread for the World. Um, we've got representatives of governments and donor agencies. And we've got some very important members of the media who are going to help us communicate what we were talking about today. We've come together today with a very clear purpose. We want to do whatever we can, individually and collectively, to end the scandal that nearly 200 million children do not have adequate nutrition, and that in consequence, their whole future life prospects are compromised. We come together for this purpose at a time of unique opportunity. We know what we need to do, technically, to end child undernutrition. We have a growing number of governments in countries which suffer from uh, high levels of undernutrition who are putting in, pl in place plans and resources to deal with this problem. Through the Scaling Up Nutrition movement, we have the framework which can bring together in a systematic way the respective contributions of governments, private sector, civil society, and, and foundations. And we have at this stage, I think, the leadership. I'm very pleased that the US and Irish governments uh, last September stepped forward to say that they both wanted to provide leadership on this issue. And that ongoing commitment by the two governments to lead was given expression yesterday in Tanzania when Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and Foreign, Irish Foreign Minister Eamon Gilmore reiterated that willingness to lead. We've leadership of the highest quality at the UN in the shape of David Navarro, and you'll see that uh, and the passion that he brings shortly. And each of you in this room, in your own way, are a leader in, in your field. At the meeting last September in New York uh, with Secretary Clinton and then Foreign Minister Martin, David Beckman of Bread for the World and I on behalf of Concern, we committed uh, to assemble this meeting today. So this today is the culmination of, if you like, a, a, a commitment made nine months ago and a, a great deal of work in between. And we said then that we wanted the main focus to be with civil society because whatever possibility there is to, to change things in regard to child undernutrition, it has to involve civil society. So many of the people who are here today um, have, a, have had a key role in this regard. And we've put together this meeting with the help of a large number of partners, and I want to, at the outset, acknowledge those partners. They include the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Irish Aid, PepsiCo, Share Our Strength, the UK Department for International Development, the World Bank, Save the Children US and UK, Interaction, the Thousand Days Campaign, the Secretary General's High Level Task Force on the Global Food Security Crisis, the Core Group, and Helen Keller International. And I want to thank each and all of these. So after all the preparation, we're here. What are we here for? In my view, we're here for three particular purposes today. I think we, we want to use this meeting to sustain the political momentum that's been building in support of the scaling up nutrition movement. I, want to, I think we are here, and there are, will be exact possibilities of this both today and in the morning tomorrow, to share our practical experiences of what's working and what needs to be done, both at national and international level, to drive the Sun movement forward. And I think most importantly of all, I want today to send everybody in this room away, fired up with renewed passion and determination, that we're going to use this moment of opportunity uh, to do something really significant in regard to uh, childhood, early childhood 
undernutrition. And I think that's the core task of what we are here today. Red and Concern have worked very well together in putting uh, this meeting together, and it's a particular pleasure to have worked with my dear friend David Beckman. We've known each other now for the best part of, of 20 years, but this is the first occasion we've really had the chance uh, to work together. As you know, David is the current World Foods, Food Prize laureate, along with Joe Luck of Heifer International. He has an outstanding achievement of advocacy on behalf of the poor, and it's a great pleasure that I now introduce David to introduce our Maria Ortego. Thank you. Good morning. Maria Otero is the U.S. Undersecretary of State for Democracy and Global Affairs. I brought this paper up because um, her job description is to oversee and coordinate U.S. foreign relations on a formidable range of issues. So I just want to read them to you. Democracy, human rights, labor, environment, oceans, health, science, population, migration, refugees, and trafficking, trafficking in persons. She's also the highest ranking Latina in the history of the US State Department. <laughs> Maria is also deeply committed to reducing poverty and hunger. She was president of Acción International, providing microfinance to four million people in 25 countries. And most importantly, she served as chair of Bread for the World's board. That was a joke. <laughs> I know Maria Otero well, and she is a wonderful human being. It's a joy to introduce Under Secretary of State Maria Otero. Thank you so much, David. Such a warm um, introduction. But what I like best about the introduction is that he calls me Maria Otero, you know, <laughs> like a good Hispanic name. <laughs> it's really wonderful to be here with this panel and to see familiar faces here. As David said, I have a long history with Breath for the World. And I remember very fondly those years that I worked on the board. Um, and of course, working with this wonderful precedent that, that Bread for the World has and David Beckman. Um, what a wonderful. <laughs> and of course, uh, as Tom mentioned, today's event is even more extraordinary because of the presence and the partnership of these two outstanding organizations, Bread and Concern Worldwide. Their intentionality and their commitment to the hungry around the world has made a real and tangible difference. And that's important for us to remember as we take this on. When many of us, I dare say everyone in this room, sets out to address the endemic challenges of hunger and undernutrition in the world, we are setting our sights high. We knew then, as we know now, that the bounty of our planet affords enough food for every human being. And yet, we know that this might be true in theory, but it has yet to be proven in practice. Tonight, after a full day's work, millions will go to bed with empty stomachs. And this year, many millions of children will die from undernutrition. When I lived in Honduras, I saw this firsthand. I saw it in the homes of many of the microentrepreneurs that I visited in my capacity as director for Acción International in that country. One time when trying to measure the impact of the loans that we met to tiny little businesses, I interviewed one of those micro-entrepreneurs, a man, who said to me, how do I know if my business is doing well? If I can feed my family, then I know my business is doing well. If I can't buy food for my family and they go to bed hungry, that tells me that my business is down. But even more starkly, I remember a trip to a small village 
in a rural part of Honduras near a place called Nakaomi. When we arrived at the home of a very poor family, as it's the custom there, they provided us with the best that they could so that we could share it with them. They gave me a plate with honey on it, nothing else. And it was honey from their beehives. I was struck by their generosity, but also filled with sorrow. This was the only thing that this family had to eat. That is why we're here, to end the pain and suffering caused by hunger and malnutrition. It is why after decades of setting out to combat global hunger, we hold fast to the truth that we can provide our fellow brothers and sisters and that we can create a future where hunger pains are not part of the world that we live in. Hunger strikes first at the individual. Too often, its early victims are children and women, but it does not stop there. Hunger strikes at communities and entire societies. Improved nutrition during pregnancy and early childhood is a critical driver for economic growth and poverty reduction in the national level. A child's cognitive and physical development is improved. A child's susceptibility to other diseases is reduced. Over the long term, these factors contribute to the workforce that is more capable and a society that is better educated and more equal. We know that investment in nutrition are high, highly cost effective and are paramount to the success of virtually all of the Millennium Development Goals. A group of leading scientists and economists, including several Nobel laureates, stated in the 2008 Copenhagen Consensus that combating undernutrition is the best investment in international development. That is a strong statement. We are here today because we know that that statement is true. Nutrition underlies many of the foreign policy priorities of the Obama administration, foremost among them women, water, global health, and mostly food security. Let me say something about these. First, women play a crucial role, not only in the nourishment of their family and, and communities and of taking care of their children, but also in the acquisition of food and reaping of harvests. And yet the gender gaps in accessing agriculture and financial resources inhibit a woman's ability to provide and to prosper. Economic projections by the Food and Agricultural Organization, the FAO, suggest that closing this gender gap will increase, uh, inclu will increase agricultural output and produce a related decrease in the number of undernourished people in vulnerable nations. To close this gap, AID funds a program that is called Women Farmer Advancement Network, WOFARM, which seeks to relieve hunger and poverty by providing training and educational resources to rural women working in agriculture. Secondly, clean water is a critical component of nutrition efforts. 40%, 40% of the world's people lack access to safe and drinking water. And waterborne diseases are the leading cause of death of children under five. By developing clean waters through what is known as WASH, water, sanitation, and hygiene, in schools programs and promoting Ex inclu exclusive breastfeeding along with appropriate complementary feeding for infants, we're taking a multi-pronged approach to ensure both adequate nutrition and food safety for our youngest and our most vulnerable. And thirdly, the U.S. government has elevated food security within our foreign policy agenda. It has recognized the extraordinary potential that it has to change the scope of international development. Feed the Future, this administration's key initiative on food security, draws on resources and expertise at the State Department, clearly at USAID, at the US Department of Agriculture, at the Millennium Challenge Account, MCC, at Treasury, at the US African Development Foundation, 
and with Peace Corps. Today, through Feed the Future, the United States is more focused on global food security than in any other time since the earliest days of the Green Revolution. This leads me, of course, to the Thousand Day Partnership, which is bringing us all together here and all the important issues under this banner, which is nutrition. As you know, the partnership supports the scaling up nutrition, the sun movement, by drawing international attention to the thousand day window of opportunity from pregnancy through age two. It is this time and this period when adequate nutrition has the greatest impact of saving lives, the greatest impact on developing a child's cognitive and physical cap capacity and mitigating the risk of chronic disease. A thousand day is also a window of opportunity for us in the international community. It is a challenge to take concerted action against undernutrition within 1,000 days. The effort and the momentum achieved during this time frame will serve as a strong foundation for moving towards the ultimate elimination of malnutrition. A thousand days takes a multi-sectoral, country-led approach to improving maternal and child nutrition. Today, I'm very pleased to be able to present my boss, who've just heard about, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, who, will, who understands the significance of the Thousand Day Initiative. As we heard, she's traveling in Africa, and yesterday, on a Sunday, she spoke about the Thousand Day Campaign in Tanzania. Let me stop here for a moment, and without further ado, I think she has a few words that she wants to share with us through video, since she can't be with us. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank Bread for the World and Concern Worldwide for hosting this event to highlight the importance of improving nutrition for mothers and children. The people of the United States and the people of Ireland are working together to find more ways to improve maternal and child nutrition in the 1,000 day window between pregnancy and when a child turns two years of age. That's when nutrition is most critical for saving lives and for promoting cognitive and physical development. Your collaboration and innovation at this conference is truly saving lives. Last September, I was honored to help launch the 1,000 Days Partnership, which is committed to advancing the work you're doing here today. 1,000 Days is helping to scale up our nutrition efforts by drawing attention to that 1,000 day window of opportunity and by challenging stakeholders to achieve results in the 1,000 days between September 2010 and June 2013. We are just over a quarter of the way through this challenge and we're already making important headway. We've increased our investments in nutrition, we are better coordinated on the ground, and we are supporting more countries in their efforts to elevate nutrition. Together with the Government of Ireland, I recently announced a new commitment to Tanzania, where the government is boldly leading an effort to improve nutrition and food security for its people. The United States is increasing our nutrition funding in Tanzania by more than fourfold, and we are devoting more of our agricultural resources to programs with greater impact on nutrition outcomes. Today, I'm pleased to launch a new tool that will help us build stronger, healthier futures for more. The thousanddays.org website has been redesigned to serve as a platform for the global nutrition community to share ideas, lessons learned, and notes from the field. It will also provide advocacy tools so that together we keep nutrition at the forefront of the international agenda where it belongs. So thank you for your dedication to improving nutrition in this critical window and for your continued support during our 1,000 days of action. I wish you a productive and successful meeting, and I can't wait to hear what new ideas and approaches you come up with. Thank you very much. We're very pleased to be able to have this new international advocacy tool 
to help keep nutrition and health of pregnant women and children on the international agenda. So there is uh, the beginning of the website, thousanddays.org. Uh, this is the homepage, and uh, it's been revamped to be able to include tools for national and international nutrition advocates and leaders. So um, continue your exceptional work and make use of this tool. It's also one that's going to allow us a forum for discussion within the broader community that works on these issues, for sharing successes, for sharing the lessons learned. This is the way in which we can help to facilitate communication, nurture a close working relationship among those that are working on nutrition, nutrition and really foster a sense of teamwork at the global level. This is, in fact, one way to support the Scaling Up Nutrition, the Sun movement. The Thousand Day Partnership supports the Sun movement, and I just want to say two words about this. It supports it primarily in two ways. First, it galvanizes the action and leadership around the critical thousand day window of opportunity between pregnancy and a child's second birthday. And second, it helps us as a global community to establish the benchmarks to improve maternal and child nutrition in the thousand days between September 2010 in June 2013, which comprises this period of time. We know that it's through political will and civil society leadership, as Tom mentioned, that we are making the strides that we need to invest in nutrition and particularly to support women and young children. The Thousand Day Partnership won't function without you and without the partners that are doing so much work to move it forward. I'm really delighted to know that the partnership is now supported by the Thousand Day Hub, which is a group of committed nutrition advocates that will help build the, the connections and help maintain this a sustained movement. We hope you'll draw on the Hub and that the new thousandday.org website will be the critical resource to amplify your exceptional work and to continue scaling this effort up so that it can have true income, true impact. By, by contributing to the 2000 Day Partnership, we are improving the health and well being of future generations and thus substantially investing in the global development, security, and prosperity. The United States is very pleased to join the Irish government and our global partners in being able to do this, especially civil society, which is taking a part that without it we would not be able to really achieve very much, but their renewed effort to combat undernutrition and to make these a critical investment in their time and effort. We all know that we are currently operating in a very difficult budget environment. We see it all around us in our states and certainly in this city and that there will, we will all be forced to make some tough choices. Nutrition investments are cost effective, they are proven, and they have impact both in the short and the long term. As Secretary Clinton announced, we are increasing our support for nutrition programs and fully support your continued efforts. And this is a message that you need to take to your representatives on the Hill. Building multi-stakeholder platforms that bring public and private sectors together will be critical in maintaining the momentum to ultimately eliminate undernutrition. Our commitment to maternal and child health must remain a priority, and we need your continued work and your continued investment in fighting hunger. We are working so that someday the bounty of the world will support every human being on the planet. We will not stop until that truth becomes a reality. Thank you. Marie, thank you very much indeed for those very good and inspiring words. We're delighted to have had Secretary of State Clinton's uh, address there. And you know, it is important to say that her personal, deep personal commitment here has a significance beyond these shores, I think, 
that that's, that's, uh, it is really important that somebody of her international stature is, pu is putting her considerable weight, political weight, behind this, this in initiative. The partnership between the Irish and the US government has been referred to, and I'm very delighted that that partnership exists. We have with us Ambassador Michael Collins from, from Irish Ambassador to, to the United States here with us this morning. He's been a wonderful support to us in every way in the past number of years, and I just want to acknowledge that, Michael. <clears throat> I now want to introduce uh, Kevin Farrell, who's the Irish uh, hunger envoy. Kevin's career and development started in a rather unusual way. He was basically rambling around the world on a, what we call nowadays a gap year. <laughs> and he reached, uh, he'd reached Bangladesh, where uh, he came across the Concern Office. Concern was working in Bangladesh from 1972. And so consistent with our mission of helping the hungry and the needy, uh, he was given a job. <laughs> it was an early form of food for work. And he has developed enormously since then. <laughs> so Kevin had a very distinguished career with the World Food Programme for almost 20 years, from 1989 to 2008. He worked in a number of key positions, including head of Great Lakes Operation in the World Food Programme headquarters in Rome, head of WFP in Uganda and Somalia, where he managed large and complex programmes. And most recently, and I saw him perform in this way myself, as head of the World Food Programme in Zimbabwe from 2002 to 2008, where he established and developed one of the largest of WFP programmes in response to the very difficult food situation in, in, in Zimbabwe at that time. He also then served as a member of the Irish Hunger Task Force and made an outstanding contribution in that regard. And then, subsequently to the publication of the task force, the Irish government asked him to become Irish Hunger Envoy. It's a great pleasure to introduce Kevin Farrell. Good morning. Um, thank you, Tom. Um, I'll get my own back. Distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to have this, to have been asked um, to address on behalf of Ireland this very important gathering and my thanks to Concern and, and Bread for the World for the invitation. We in Ireland, as I'm sure most of you know, have a very special historical connection with hunger. The great Irish famine of the 1840s, that's only 160 odd years ago, when almost a quarter of our population either died of starvation or emigrated to avoid it, many of them came here, has remained in our consciousness and indeed underpins today the very strong focus and priority which we have on tackling and reducing global hunger. As Tom mentioned back in 2007, I was privileged to be a member of the Hunger Task Force along, I, I think you said, with himself and a few others. That was a group that was set up to try to help identify the particular contribution that Ireland could make in this whole effort to reduce hunger. The report recommended a program of actions to address the three particular priorities which we in Ireland still believe can have the greatest impact in this fight. One, and in many ways they're not maybe earth shattering at this stage, but one was in, um, increasing agricultural productivity um, with a particular focus on women farmers and particularly in Africa. Secondly, implementing programs focused on maternal and infant undernutrition. And thirdly, ensuring that we have a real political commitment at national and international levels to give hunger the absolute priority it deserves. Now, since the publication of that report in 2008, Ireland has committed to put, er, to put the eradication of hunger at the forefront of our overseas development program, and indeed, our foreign policy. And I'm happy to say that currently, I believe we're well on track to have, by next year, at least 20% of our whole overseas aid program spent on such programs and efforts to tackle hunger. 
This may, of course, be modest. <laughs> this may, of course, be modest in, in purely quantitative terms compared with that of other larger players in this. But in terms of per capita support in the country and in terms of the commitment of both the country and its people, I believe it is significant. And clearly, and this was pointed out very recently by none other than President Obama during his recent visit to Ireland, we share that commitment in combating hunger with the government and, of course, the people of the United States. Of course, in the Feed the Future initiative, those two priorities, scaling up agricultural production and tackling maternal and child undernutrition, are, of course, key priorities of the United States government. And I'm delighted, incidentally, to note that our teams in the field are working so well together in this whole effort. Of course, a very important part of that joint commitment is the support for SUN and the, sorry, the scaling up of nutrition movement, and within that for the Thousand Days initiatives, which was referred to earlier, which was launched last September by Secretary of State Clinton and Ireland's then Minister of Foreign Affairs, Michal Martin. The intention behind that initiative is, of course, that it be the start of a much larger global movement to focus attention on undernutrition, to increase resources, and to build partnerships to alleviate what is, I'm sure you'll all agree, this obscenity of global hunger, where tens, indeed hundreds of millions of people, and I think we're focused here today particularly on pregnant women and children under two, simply do not have adequate amounts and quality of food to lead anything like normal lives. Now, I don't need to go into the reasons why we all believe that tackling malnutrition head-on is so vital. I think we're all aware of the compelling moral reasons, as well as what we might call the more, uh, more quoted economic reasons why this is so important. Why children who do have adequate nutrition in the first thousand days are so much more likely to lead healthy and productive lives. And of course, there's the other side of that, where the mental and physical damage caused by inadequate nutrition in the first two years is largely irreversible. And for me, this is the most disturbing part. For this gathering, I don't think I need, I'll, I'll take all this the, the, the rationale for this is red, and I'm certainly not going to go into the mechanics or the architecture of the sun movement. This will be dealt with, I'm sure, by others. But because I want to stress and to speak a little bit about Ireland's commitment, I'll just refer to two or three actions which we are taking in the field. That phrase, in the field, remember it's in the field that this whole idea, idea stands or falls. And by the field, I don't just mean in the countries with high levels of malnutrition, the so-called high burden countries. I'm not just speaking about the impact our actions have with governments or even with institutions in the country. It's what happens at community and more specifically at household level that matters. It's really and quite simply about how many especially mothers and children, are now being adequately nourished or fed as a result of this combined effort. So what is Ireland doing? Since last September, and I note we're already about a quarter of the way into the Thousand Day Movement, Ireland has significantly scaled up our investment in nutrition programs, particularly in Africa. I'll cite three very briefly. At the moment, we're involved in partnerships with the Global Alliance to Improve Nutrition, that's GAIN, with the Micronutrient Initiative and others to fortify wheat and other cereals with essential minerals and vitamins. Or is it vitamins? <laughs> We're involved in scaling up the production and distribution of orange fleshed sweet potato. I knew you would recognize we wouldn't be too far from the potato. This sweet potato, which is particularly rich in vitamin A, vitamin A, we're working with smallholders in both Ethiopia and Malawi um, and in a program jointly with the International Potato Center, SIP. 
Thirdly, we're supporting the government of Sierra Leone to implement its national nutrition strategy, including infant and young child feedings and its community management of acute malnutrition. That incidentally is a program that Ireland has been quite um, engaged in. I think it was something that was, was pioneered by Concern and a, another NGO called Valid International and I think is one of the exciting things that's being done in this field of acute malnutrition. I won't go into the details, others are more familiar with it, but I think it's one of the things that, is, that we are keen to continue to support. I mention only three um, points. We could certainly talk about the continuing support that we have been giving and con will continue to give to the UN high-level task force and under the Secretary General's Special Representative David Nabarro, who is doing such a, an excellent job with his team in giving leadership to this whole effort. Um, mention has been made by at least two other people about the events in Tanzania yesterday, so I'll be very brief, but just simply to say that that for us is, was a very important event. I think it highlighted two particular aspects, or two particular aspects are, are particularly important. One is the, the strong leadership from ourselves and the United States. And secondly, the particularly, or the strong country-led nature, the, the buy-in, the strong buy-in that is obviously now coming from the government of Tanzania. So Ireland will certainly play its part to support these country-led efforts. Our intention is to make nutrition a central thread of our whole development program in Tanzania, particularly emphasizing the importance of a strong intersectoral approach, that is promoting food security and nutrition across sectors. Turning to today's meeting, the meeting is, of course, focused on the, on the key role that civil society has to play in improving nutrition. And naturally, I very much welcome this initiative, and I want to commend the excellent work being done in this regard by a lot of civil society partners here, particularly by Concern and Bread for the World, two of the key global players in this area. Um, I think at this meeting, we obviously need to think hard how well, or maybe in some respects, how not so well, we are doing, and how we can all address even more effectively the real challenges to implementation of this program. We will, I'm sure, reflect on the critical importance of national ownership and, and of programs in both goal setting and in implementation, what I referred to in the, in the case of Tanzania. And I know that the US and Ireland are both very firmly committed to that. I'm sure we will also reflect on the need for all development partners, that is governments, both at local, regional, and national levels, donors, multilateral institutions, civil society, private sector, and others to coordinate their actions, especially at country level. I mentioned the private sector, and certainly at the launch last September, it was encouraging to hear of the commitment and potential contribution of the private sector to Sun and to the Thousand Days, and to learn of some of the innovative ways that they are already and, and can in the future become more engaged in this work. And I'm sure we'll hear some more examples in the course of this meeting. Let me add one more set. I believe we need a very inclusive approach, one that brings together more non-traditional partners, not just the private sector, but for example, smallholder farmer organizations, women's organizations, trade unions, the media, consumer associations, professional bodies. I suggest these all have a huge contribution to make in this battle. And I would further suggest that civil society organizations can be particularly effective in bringing about that engagement. A final point I want to make, and that is the importance of our being able to measure the impact on the ground of the programs we support. This is something that we are particularly keen to ensure since without evidence of a positive impact, in effect, evidence of a strong return of, in, on investment, we all know how extremely difficult it is to maintain and in, indeed increase the momentum we have so far managed to build 
and which we all recognize is vital. I'm reminded of this oft-repeated message on the importance of having the political will to act, not just having the knowledge and the means to act. The Hunger Task Force report that I referred to earlier spoke, spoke back in 2008. It said, the analysis that is of the problem is there, the commitment is there, but unless we act on these commitments, we will never eradicate hunger and starvation from our world. So I look forward to the discussion today and to hearing more on precisely what we feel these actions are which are needed, and especially what civil society partners believe can and must be done to make the Sun and the Thousand Day Movement or initiative even more effective. And when I say effective, Again, I mean at household and individual family level. And I mean effective in the only terms that really matter, which is how much and how quickly we are reducing and even hopefully making some inroads in eliminating this massive human tragedy, this scandal of widespread malnutrition in the world. Thank you. I, I am really inspired by uh, Ireland's leadership on poverty and specifically hunger issues. Uh, he didn't even mention Bono. <laughs> and until our president went to Ireland recently, I never knew there was an apostrophe in his name. Did you know it's Obama? <laughs> <laughs> What's brought us here is partly new knowledge. A series of studies were done all around the world, published in January 2008. And those studies showed us which are the most effective ways, the most impactful ways, to reduce child malnutrition. And those studies were financed in part by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The Gates Foundation has also played a catalytic role in getting lots of the agencies, the international agencies that run child nutrition programs in development, developing countries, to agree on a common set of priorities, a common plan of action. And that's scaling up nutrition. Three of our colleagues from the Gates Foundation are with us today, Oying Ramon, Ellen P. Waz, Jennifer Kurtz. And now to speak with us by video, we have um, Melinda French Gates. Hello, I'm Melinda Gates, and I'm so pleased to be participating in this important meeting. When Bill and I decided to focus on philanthropy over a decade ago, one of the first things we learned is that while children in rich countries got all the nutrients they needed, children in poor countries were lacking the basic nutrition they'd need to grow up strong and healthy. That's why one of our first major investments was to understand and address malnutrition. Since then, I've taken many trips to learn about how we can improve children's health. On a recent trip to Nairobi, I spoke with a group of women about their children. And one mother told me, I want to bring every good thing to the one child I have before I have another. And it reinforced for me that there's something universal in motherhood, that mothers everywhere have the same goal for their children. We all want a successful future for our children. So whether you're meeting mothers and their children or reading the latest research, one thing is completely clear. A child's future depends on good nutrition. That's why I'm so excited about the Thousand Days Initiative. We know that good nutrition, particularly during the thousand days between pregnancy and a child's second birthday, makes all the difference in the world for that child. If we can get nutrition right, we can save millions of lives, and we can give tens of millions of children a chance 
for a better future. So what can we do to keep moving forward? I believe innovation is key. It's not only central to technology. Innovation can achieve stunning breakthroughs without being high tech. I'm talking about pioneering ways of changing behavior, working with communities and the private sector and sharing these new ideas with women in the poorest areas of the world. Take, for example, breastfeeding. We know exclusive and immediate breastfeeding when the newborn is fed only with breast milk and nothing else in the first six months is one of the best ways to raise a healthy child. So encouraging mothers to exclusively breastfeed is a behavior change that we know saves lives. We all have a role to play. You're part of a strong faith-based community that has given voice to the voiceless and the most vulnerable. In the end, it's individuals like all of you here today who can mobilize the public and build political support for the fight against malnutrition. I want to thank Bread for the World and Concern Worldwide for convening this meeting. And I want to thank all of you for your hard work and your commitment to ensuring that all children have the nutrition they need for a healthy start in life. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. I want to introduce David Navarro, Dr. David Navarro now. Uh, what the official bio says is that he was appointed uh, the UN Secretary General's Special Representative for Food Security and Nutrition in October two 2009. He's worked in the office of the Secretary General as Senior UN System Coordinator for Avian and Pandemic Influenza since 2005, and since 2000, January 2009 has coordinated the UN High Level Task Force on the Food Security Crisis. Before joining the Secretary General's office, he worked since 1999 with the World Health Organization, serving as uh, Executive Director, working on issues that included the Commission on Macroeconomics and Health, Health Systems Assessments, and the creation of global funds to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. And before becoming Executive Director, he led the WHO's Roll Back Malaria Campaign, its cluster handling food safety, emergency health action, and environmental health, and in 2003, its Department for Health in Crisis. That's the official bio. What any of us who know David Navarro know is that he brings to that list of formal achievements a passion and a commitment to this particular issue which is both enormously inspiring and has inspired many of people through, who, who, in, in this room, and a great effectiveness in doing that. And his, the conceptualization of the sun as a movement, uh, in, in, including uh, the very many partners, I think David has been at the heart of that. And I have great pleasure in asking him to address us. Thomas, thank you very much indeed. Oh, it's great to be here. Very, very good. It's actually fantastic to be speaking alongside uh, Secretary Clinton and Maria Otero, Kevin Farrell and Melinda Gates, Tom Arnold, David Beckman, at such a great event. So many people, many people who've traveled a long way to get here from Africa and Asia, Latin America, people who are grassroots activists for the issues we're discussing. I'm here representing Ban Ki-moon, the United Nations Secretary General, but I'd like to start my address today from a personal perspective. Between 1976 and 1985, I worked as a child health doctor in Nepal, in Bangladesh, in India, and in other parts of Southeast Asia. And I became persistently frustrated at the way in which the undernutrition of pregnant women and children was so often neglected in public policy and was not given the attention it needed. You could see it in front of your eyes, children who were undernourished 
were less engaged with their surroundings, less able to participate and be active and to play with other children. And of course, the, the, the science tells us that those are the children who do not develop intellectually and physically as well as others. It's a kind of lifelong handicap. And that will be the theme of part of my presentation today, that our challenge is to help address the lifelong handicap of undernutrition. But also I want to talk about the real promise we have at the moment uh, for efforts to scaling up, to scale up nutrition. From my viewpoint, this effort is not a program, it's not even an initiative, it is a movement that brings together a whole range of stakeholders that want to be active, to work together and to make a difference. And today is an opportunity for those of us who feel part of that movement to plan together how we can really move one, two, three, four steps further forward towards the goal, as we heard just now, of eliminating undernutrition, particularly in young children. Uh, the movement as a whole at the moment seems to be quite small, but I do sense that seeds are sprouting, growing, and multiplying. And perhaps for me, part of what I want to do today is to hear from all of you how we can be more effective in spreading the movement and also at the same time achieving results. And that, for me, is the goal for today, to get the results that make a difference as quickly and as sustainably as possible. First theme for what I want to say is as follows. There are too many hungry people, and they're hungry for too much of the time in our world. Now, hunger, as I'm sure all of you realize, but it's worth reminding us ourselves, is more than the unpleasant feeling that we get from time to time when we've skipped a meal, or even that slightly virtuous feeling that we get when we've fasted for a day or two. Chronic hunger is a miserable, debilitating, humili humiliating and frustrating sensation for all who experience it. It weakens, dampens and saddens the human spirit. It restricts people's potential to grow and to empower others. For those who are affected, hunger in childhood is a serious lifelong disadvantage. In our technical language, we refer to that disadvantage as food and nutrition insecurity. And what we mean by that is that people's bodies lack the nutrients that they need for health, for growth of brain and body, and for full activity. And undernutrition in childhood is a program that affects children for life. It is imprinting uh, on the body a disadvantage that is very, very hard to overcome. And nearly one billion people, that's around one-sixth of the world's population, are hungry. And all those people are at risk of undernutrition. And that is a very big global problem. But it gets bigger because even more people, perhaps another one billion, are not actually hungry, but they're affected by a shortage of micronutrients, the vitamins and minerals that are so important for good growth and development. So if you add them together, one billion plus one billion, two billion, nearly one third of the world's population, one third of humanity, is affected by undernutrition and its consequences. This is a, an emergency. It's not just us who should be involved in it. It should be engaging every world leader, every civil society head, everybody who's concerned about the future of our world. And yet, as we all know, it's been neglected. Why are people hungry and why does it matter? Because, as, again, as all of you know, we live in a world where there is more than enough food to go around. So why are one-sixth of the world's population hungry? Perhaps here it's useful being technical for a minute or two. Firstly, we need to focus on whether or not in the places where people live, 
the food that they need is available? Is it in the market? Is it there all the year round? Or are there some months of the year when there just isn't nutritious food available? This issue of availability is hugely important and we rely on farmers, on people who process and distribute food, on ministries of agriculture to help get that one right. My colleague, Dr. Kasim Massey, sitting in the front row here, comes from Zambia. And he and his team were telling us that the period, four month period, December, January, February, March in Northern Zambia is referred to as the hunger because that's the time of year when food is almost always in very short supply in local markets. And that's one of the reasons why many Zambian people, particularly from that region, are affected by, from un, by undernutrition. But people who've lived and worked in Cambodia, a country where there are some pockets of considerable prosperity, are familiar with another problem that you have even in wealthy areas high levels of undernutrition. Why? Because there are communities who, despite the fact that food is available, can't actually access that food when they need it, usually because they can't afford it. If they've been working in a garment factory and they've just been made redundant because the market for manufactured, tailored goods from Cambodia is not so good now as it was three or four years ago, you are likely to face difficulty with feeding your children. If you don't have the purchasing power, if you don't have the means to get to market because roads are impassable or bridges are down, or if you're simply just too busy doing work on your fields and you can't get to go and buy the special food that your children need for good nutrition, then you can't access food. So a second reason is access and lack of access. A third reason why hunger and malnutrition is a problem is that even if people can access the food they want, Sometimes, because of factors in the household, they don't use that food to yield better nutrition in pregnant women or young children. It may be because there isn't enough time in the household for mother who's busy looking after a lot of children, looking after others in the household, looking after the animals, looking after the land, because women do most of the jobs. They just don't have time to feed their children with what they need. And if their children are sick and their appetite is poor, anyone here who's tried to feed a sick child who will not take the food or perhaps is vomiting all the time knows that it's very hard to maintain malnutrition when kids are sick. So in that household, especially when there is illness, it's often hard to maintain good nutrition because using the food to yield good nutritional outcomes is difficult. So remember those words, availability, access and utilization. They all have to be taken into account when we're trying to address undernutrition. And often at the center of this, as we heard from Melinda Gates and also from others, is the need for women to have the knowledge about the importance of good nutrition during early childhood, during pregnancy as well. So there are a number of key reasons for hunger, for malnutrition in our world today and they're not straightforward and they have to be understood. There are no simple, unfortunately, no simple magic bullets here to help us. But the problem can be resolved. There's no need for nations to be affected by undernutrition. Brazil, for example, has shown that solutions to hunger and undernutrition are available if you get strong political leadership, the involvement of multiple government ministries doing the right thing, implementing the kind of activities that David just told us. If you've got synergy between different actors so that they implement what is known by evidence to be effective, and if you get participation of civil society, of businesses, of women's organizations and farmer associations, of consumer groups, and if you get, at the same time, international bodies and regional bodies providing support, you can push the collective effort to improve undernutrition and reduce the levels of malnutrition and get positive results. President Lula led the hunger zero battle in Brazil and showed success and others can and are beginning to follow suit. A key to success is the creation of platforms 
that bring together different groups who are involved in food security, health and social welfare, so that they will enable multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder efforts. Those of you who've been activists, who've worked at local and community level, understand the vital importance of these platforms on which different groups of people can work together. And that, as the Brazilian experience has shown, is one of the keys. Now, the world as a whole does need to get its act together on nutrition. This one-sixth of the world population affected by chronic hunger and a total of one-third undernourished is having major disempowering and weakening effects on the human population. And it's not an impossible challenge. World leaders have taken on other issues that appeared to be impossible 10, 15 years ago and started to make a real difference. I watched as malaria moved from being a completely impossible dead loss area in the mid-1990s to being an area now where there is real scope for seeing massive reductions, even elimination in malaria deaths in vast parts of the world, particularly in Africa. How has that become possible? Answer, because the communities that have worked together on malaria have shown that it is a proposition that can work with good scientific experiments, case studies from community level, and the engagement of hundreds, thousands, and now tens of thousands of activists who are working together around a single strategy for malaria control. We have convinced a collection of cynical governments, development agencies, and others that instead of being a dead loss area, this is one of the best investments of resources that will make a difference to human destiny, particularly, as I say, in Africa. We've seen the same happen on HIV AIDS. It took time, it took effort, it took activism, it took tears. But we have seen that area advance greatly, so that in last week's Economist, we were seeing suggestions that perhaps HIV AIDS was, in inverted commas, a plague that can be conquered. We've seen similar shifts in tuberculosis. Now is the time to make the step change for nutrition to ensure that all can realize, especially when they're in senior positions and handling resources, that this is an area where proper investment, proper engagement, proper coming together of different actors and empowering of local communities will enable us to see a reduction in levels of undernutrition. But it requires all of us in this room and hundreds of others with whom we're in contact to build that energy, that sense of understanding and agreement that we can do it. How? Uh, Tom, three or four more minutes? Okay. <laughs> Actually, I wrote this. I wrote it uh, over the weekend. I don't normally write, and one of the reasons why I'm stumbling on my words is I'm trying to stick to the script. And that's because, it, for me, it's important. This is such an important meeting because it is the opportunity to raise the game and to increase the momentum. And you don't get this chance very often with a group as strong as this. So who are the people who can help us? Well, I want to identify Josette Sharon, the executive director of the World Food Programme. She talks about the burden of knowledge, picking up on what David Beckman just said. We know the damage caused by undernutrition. We've got it in facts and figures, economic cost, intellectual cost, developmental cost, political cost. We also know what can be done about it. We know how inexpensive and effective the interventions that can be applied through giving specific foodstuffs or encouraging breastfeeding or supporting women when they're weeding their children. We know the costs and we know the interventions. So we have that burden of knowledge. We have groups that have shown that this knowledge can be applied at local level. In this room are many people from organizations like Médecins Sans Frontières, Action Contre la Femme, Action Aid, Helen Kedder, Interaction, Concern, Bread for the World, people who have experience of how to do it. 
they can witness to the potential and the opportunity for reducing undernutrition. They are also ready to be called for account on their support for country efforts. And it's that challenge now to make certain that given that we know the problem, given that we have the techniques, that everybody involved in government, in development, and in support for the empowerment of communities to improve their situation says, I am ready to be called, for a, called to account for the need to act on undernutrition, for our collective failure to get where we need to be, and for being part of the movement. This is the time for a commitment to accountability. We have various tools that can help us. We have a roadmap for scaling up nutrition, what David described and what Kevin and Tom and others have referred to that shows what we've got to do. We've got many leaders ready to put their head and shoulders behind this roadmap, particularly like to pick out the people on the podium here, Tony Lake, the executive director of UNICEF, Margaret Chan, the director general of WHO, Bob Zellick of the World Bank and his team, and Bob will be with us at lunchtime, and many development ministers and other senior officials who are ready to be called to account and who want to be shown ways in which they can, uh, they can address the problem. And we've got the thousand day partnership there to provide us with the advocacy that we need. So during the last nine months since September, we have seen more countries now saying to us, okay, you say that you're ready to support us as we address this challenge. Are you actually prepared to do so? And so some of the people from the countries who are in this room today have elected to be early risers in the scale-up nutrition movement. They've elected to start working and acting and take some very tough political action in their countries, getting the prime minister and the president to establish a central focal point getting the government to develop a budget line for nutritional action, getting the Minister of Agriculture, the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Local Government, the Minister of Education, the Minister of Social Welfare and the Minister of Gender to come together and think, how can we make our efforts sensitive to nutritional issues? How can we enable women to get more time to breastfeed, to wean more support as they do this work, as Melinda Gates just described, the center of women's needs and concerns about their children? but we've got that effort going on at the country level. How can the rest of the world, civil society, business, governments, scientists, foundations, development banks, and donor agencies now respond to the new energy and actually come up with what is needed? And that's where we are today. In this room, we have more than 100 Bread for the World activists who are here to talk to politicians in this country about what needs to be done. We must remember the power of US leadership, of Irish leadership, of leadership from other great nations in development issues. If US and Ireland are prepared to say, we are taking undernutrition seriously, they are listened to, but they need to do it in a consistent way with finance, with political backing, and with the sort of support that will help country level actors to make a difference. And that's why when you talk with legislators today, tomorrow, next week, next month, over the years, stress to them that US leadership along with Irish, European, Japanese, Australian, African Union, ASEAN leadership in this challenge to reduce the burden of malnutrition is critical. We need to support countries as they put nutrition higher up the development agenda. We need the G20 meeting in Cannes in November this year to put nutrition as one of its priority goals for the next five years. We need to see at the UN General Assembly, nations saying the disgrace of undernutrition must be put high on the agenda, especially as we're coming towards the Millennium Development Goal uh, decision point of 2015. 
By September, we need to see some proper, strong financial commitments, building on those that have already been announced by the United States and Ireland, so that we can say to countries, we have some resources ready to help you. And lastly, we need all of us to stay united, working together to common purpose. If we look at the history of work on nutrition, too often it has been affected by fragmentation and disagreement. No more. We owe it to the world to work together to help ensure that the scandal of chronic undernutrition and the suffering associated with it starts to become history tomorrow and in the next few months. And that within the next 10 years, we can look back and say, at that meeting on June the 13th, 2011, we really felt that the world was going to change, because it will. Thank you.